I'm Stumpy Dubs, this is Mustache Mike, and welcome to another edition of Behind the Sawdust, the show that dares to ask just what is under Roy Underhill's hat. This week we argue about precision tools, get some tips for resawing book matched panels, a bear loses a fight with a saw, we tell you how Bosch might have saved it, I throw my weight around, Bob Lang comes back from the dead, and we give some more stuff away. You also notice this week that you won't be seeing any of those annoying ad banners at the bottom of your screen, and we have Rockler Woodworking and Hardware to thank for it since they've been good enough to sponsor this episode. So be sure and thank them by visiting via the link in the show notes below. you are glad you did. Now, let's get started with the woodworking news. Abraham Lincoln took his last ride in style. And the Blue Ox Millwork School for Veterans wants you to see that classic ride again. The late president's beautiful funeral hearse was unfortunately destroyed in a fire some 130 years ago. Now, though, a group of soldiers turned craftsmen are working on a full-size replica in preparation for the 150th anniversary of the assassination. They have only, though, one photograph of the original to work from, and, of course, many of the components are just not available anymore. So it took months just to figure out the dimensions. They even had to locate in Kentucky a wheelwright who could recreate those unique 16-spoke wheels. But the project is almost complete. The labor is being donated free, and a funeral home is covering the $40,000 in materials so that the hearse can once again roll down the streets of Springfield, Illinois this May. What do bicycle shop owners do for fun? Well, if you're Dave of Portland's River City Bike Shop, you spend your free time building wooden fixtures for your store. Since opening in 1995, Dave has shared the philosophy that drives many woodworkers. Why buy it when you can build it? He's been able to customize his store with everything from bike racks to display cabinets, all designed to his particular tastes and needs. They've recently produced a high-quality video discussing his woodworking pursuits, and it's well worth the three minutes it'll take to watch. you find a link in the show notes. Buying a spoke shave has been likened to buying a car. There's a lot of different models out there, and choosing the right one can make the difference between a comfortable ride and a fiery death. Luckily, though, Tom Casper from Woodworkers Guild of America has produced a five-minute video telling you everything you'd ever want to know about both spoking and shaving. He covers wooden bodies, metal bodies, flat bodies, round bodies, hard bodies, you name it. So before your next shave, you might want to check out the link below in the show notes. Don't you hate it when your artsy becomes too fartsy? Well, the work of Vincent Kohler may be just for you. The Swiss artist's latest exhibition shows off the unadulterated beauty of the log, specifically the wood that hides within. His exploding tree peels back the bark to reveal various cuts of wood we woodworkers might use. In a society that considers a jar of urine or a rusty hubcap to be art, it's nice to know somebody still knows what true beauty is. Speaking of art, the associate art director of Fine Woodworking Magazine is no schlub when it comes to woodworking. John Tetrialt built his stunning end table for a friend based on the design of an old side table with aluminum legs. John's version replaces the metal with gracefully formed walnut legs, each of which are tapered from top to bottom and tilted about 7 degrees. He used locally sourced, air-dried materials, and the result is proof that they didn't hire him just for his pencil-pushing skills. Peter Ross says you may be fussing too much. As a period blacksmith, he's learned that aiming for perfection is a modern phenomenon, whether in ironwork or woodwork. The old-timers developed their techniques to do things quickly and with few tools and fussing. This is in direct conflict with the attitude of many modern woodworkers, so we thought it would be a great subject for another edition of Point Counterpoint. I'll be arguing the precision side of the question. I think the modern workshop has made it easier to work with very precise tolerances. I'll argue the other side. I believe it's pointless to measure to the thousandth of an inch when you're working with a constantly changing material like wood. I agree wood does change with moisture, but that's no excuse for shoddy craftsmanship. If you can get a perfect joint, why not do it? No two craftsman is going to tolerate shoddy craftsmanship, but perfection is a relative term. There's a reason woodworking rulers typically have graduations down to only a 32nd of an inch. We don't have to work in microns to achieve good results. Today's woodworking tools are more precise than ever. 
The trend has been for tighter tolerances, and I think that's a good thing because precision tools create precision joinery and fewer mistakes. Nonsense. Precision tools require more setup, which means more opportunity for you to screw up. Do you think 18th century masters measured down to the billionth of an inch? They eyeballed their dovetail angles, for goodness sakes. And look at what they were able to accomplish. They accomplished through skill what lesser woodworkers can now accomplish through tool technology. A precision dovetail jig can make even a mediocre woodworker create tight-fitting joints that he would have never been able to do freehand. It's all fine and good. I just wonder if we really need to fuss over our tool setups as much as we do. I know people who are going to freak out if their saw blade is two thousandths of an inch out of alignment. They spend more time adjusting their tools than they do using them. And their projects don't look any better than mine. Well, that's a matter of opinion too. But besides that, if a precision tool makes a woodworker feel better, what is wrong with that? And there's my point. A lot of this is all about selling tools. People make great furniture with regular tools for generations. Suddenly we need a laser on everything, and if you don't own at least a dozen digital gauges, you're not a serious woodworker. My table saw fence has a knob to move it one thousandth of an inch at a time. It's out of control. So how precise is precise enough? An inch? A quarter inch? How about we just throw our project parts in the middle of the bench, squirt construction adhesive all over them, and see what happens? One thirty-second is precise if I want to sound like a real craftsman, but in reality one sixteenth is usually good. My goodness, I do not know how you even sleep at night. Remember when Rock was young? Me and Susie had so much fun. Long nights by the record machine, dreaming of my Chevy and my old blue jeans. Yes, the classic jukebox has gone the way of the dodo. Now that music is more commonly blasted from our cell phones through Bluetooth speakers. Well, that's about to change. David Whitehead, a wood pattern maker at England's Sound Leisure Jukebox Company, has turned his half-century of woodworking skills loose, and the result is a handmade birch and mahogany Bluetooth jute box. It's patterned after the classic 1973 Wurlitzer. Now at $450, these wooden beauties, of course, aren't cheap. And there's a four to five week lead time for each one. But you gotta admit, that's pretty awesome. Music and wood seem to be an unlikely combination but we're seeing it more and more these days. Recently, the folks over at Romanian-based Meze sent me a pair of their classic 73 headphones. Industrial designer Antonio Meze came up with the idea of creating the ear cups from hand-carved ebony for a unique sound and a stunning look. They appear more suited for the fashion runway than the workshop, but I have to say I'm absolutely in love with these suckers. I'm not an audiophile by any means. In fact, I don't even like the way that sounds. But I can't get over how clear these things are and how comfortable they are to wear. I've been using them in the shop to listen to music and audiobooks for some time now, and they really surpass any of the other sets I've owned. Why am I telling you about headphones? Because they're made out of wood, and I think that's pretty awesome. If there's a company out there doing something creative like this, I want you to know about it. So I'm putting a link to the Meze headphones in the show notes below. Fine Woodworkings, Matthew Kenny says there's a couple of tricks to resawing wood for book matched panels, and he recently shared them with us. First of all, the closer the end grain is to running perpendicular to the board's face, such as with quarter sawn or rift sawn lumber, the better the end result is going to be. Flat sawn boards generally make poor book matched panels. He also says to remove as little as possible while cleaning up your resawn surfaces. He prefers a hand plane to a power joiner because the more wood you remove, the more the grain will change. But matching is a great way to turn a narrow board into a wide one. So keep these tips in mind the next time you resaw your own. David Heim totally enjoyed totally turning. The Pro Turner Turned Blogger attended the 12th Annual Symposium held by the Adirondack Woodturners Association in Saratoga Springs, New York last week. 6,000 attendees were at the two-day event, which he says is a good place to find accomplished artisans at the top of their game. Among the highlights was a demonstration of freehand sphere turning by Dick Gerard, a live edge bowl class with David Ellsworth, and a demonstration on how to embellish turnings with dyes and paints. David says he's jazzed 
and eager for next year's totally turning event. Recently, Jeff Burks of the Lost Art Press blog shared an 1820 poem about a bear's experience in a sawmill. We here at the workshop enjoyed it so much that Stumpy has decided to treat us to a dramatic reading of that text. <clears throat> you never should attack a foe until his arms and strength you know, and this we will clearly show in the tale we shall here relate of the catastrophe and fate of Miss Bridget Bruin. One day a sawmill she came near, just at the time of the Sawyer's cheer, was brought him for his dinner. It smells right sweet, quoth the beast. I'm hungry and I'll have a feast, as sure as I'm a sinner. Sawyer, do you be off, said she, and leave your sawmill here to me to learn the art of sawing. And do you lay that dinner down upon the log there, or you clown your carcass I'll be pawing. The Sawyer thought it wise to shun disputes with bears, so off he run, and left his meal behind, sir. He'd grieve to leave a dish so good, but left it on the log of wood to Mistress Bruin's mind, sir. Upon the log she quickly leapt, and busily her teeth were kept upon the eggs and bacon. This is, quoth she, right dainty fare, and worthy of a lady bear, or I am much mistaken. While thus engaged with tooth and nail, she to the saw had turned her tail, intent alone on feeding. The saw meantime determined sure that if his teeth should get to her, they'd teach her better breeding. And as he kept advancing slow, he reached her tail and nicked so as to make it bleed, sir. She turned and growled, you saucy dog, before that I have left this log, I'll mark you for that deed, sir. But being hungry to her food, again she turned with stomach good to fight not yet inclined, sir. The saw advancing every stroke at length on her posterior broke and docked her close behind, sir. Thunder and blixen, roared the bear. In Shangam she had learned to swear. I'll give you caterwauling. Then furious turned on Mr. Saw, who firm withstood her gripe and jaw, and with his teeth tore out her maw and quickly laid her sprawling. Thank you, Stumpy, but I think I would stay with woodworking. In other lost art press news, virtuoso, the tool cabinet and workbench of Henry O. Studley is ready at last. Don Williams' long-anticipated book tells us the story of the famous tool cabinet of a Massachusetts piano maker. Studley's cabinet was just 39 inches tall and 19 inches wide, yet it holds more than 250 fine tools nested together in a manner that staggers the mind. The book asks how he built it and why a man would create such a monument to his tools. But more than that, it examines every inch of the collection with photographs and even measurements. The 216-page book is available for pre-order and will begin shipping out in about mid-March. But if you want to pick it up early, you can order it for pickup at the Handworks Hand Tool event in Amana, Iowa. Speaking of the Handworks Hand Tool event in Amana, Iowa, the Handworks Hand Tool Event will be held in Amana, Iowa on May 15th and 16th. You can join modern hand tool masters and fellow enthusiasts for a weekend immersed in all things handwork. Unplug from the world of machines, dust and noise while listening to the crisp sounds of the hand plane, chisel and saw in a restored timber frame barn in the traditional historic German village of Amana. Roy Underhill will be there and so will the amazing studly tool chest and workbench. Small groups will be able to spend time with the tools, examining and photographing them for the first time in history. Speaking of hand tools, Bosch Power Tools has shocked the woodworking world with a huge announcement. They've developed their own version of a table saw with flesh sensing technology. Now we know up until now, saw stop possessed the only commercially available saw that wouldn't cut the skin. Bosch uses their own cartridge design that they say will not damage the blade when activated. While the saw stop system includes an aluminum brake that stops the blade motion and drops it below the table, the Bosch version only drops the blade without stopping it. Their cartridge can also be used twice before it has to be replaced. Now the only problem is that the Bosch technology only comes on a small job site quality saw which actually costs significantly more than SawStop's new job site saw. Whether Bosch will attempt to manufacture a top quality cabinet saw using the new cartridge system as the SawStop already has, I guess that's yet to be seen. But 
you got to admit, it's an interesting development, and we're going to stay right on top of it. Chris Schwartz has finally given in to our relentless pressure. For weeks, we've been complaining that he keeps teasing us about the new tool chest project he's been working on with Jamil Abraham. He's been waving photos of the outside of the chest under our noses while only hinting at the alleged carved marquetry design on the inside of the lid. I, for one, hate to be titillated. So we cranked up the pressure in our last episode of Behind the Sawdust, eliciting a response from popular woodworking magazine chief Megan Fitzpatrick, who said it was she who was playing this cruel game of hide-and-speak. Well, the photo has finally been released. And while I have to agree that it is an amazing work of art, I can't help taking credit for this early reveal before the stated target of the August issue. Clearly, we here at Behind the Sawdust know how to throw our weight around, and my weight was just too much for Megan and Chris to bear. Perhaps next we'll use our influence to get Frank Klaus to give us a video tour of his Plum Bob collection, or maybe we'll try to force Norm Abram to bring back the New Yankee Workshop. Stay tuned, because my weight gets heavier every day. Speaking of weight, how big is your chest? That's what Christopher Schwartz asked in his recent blog post about his new tool chest, which uh, wasn't influenced, believe me, by Stumpy in any way. Christopher says that tool chests should be a standard size. That standard? Large enough to fit our tools. No, he didn't say to fit your tools. He said to fit our tools. The point is this, that hand tools that have been required for furniture making haven't really changed much over the centuries. So tool chests have always seemed to be of a fairly standard size. He goes on to discuss the three most common, including the floor chests, the traveling chest, and the tall boy. It's a very interesting blog and well worth your time. So if you'd like to read it, follow the link in the show notes below. Chris also spent some time telling us how to fight the urge. He says that he's noticed something strange about his students' work. While they may be perfectionists when it comes to small projects like boxes, they get a little sloppy when building larger projects like tool chests. So I guess I'll ask the question, have you ever had that problem, Stumpy? Oh yes, of course, we all have. You know, maybe if I'm building something like a big project like this workbench when I built it, I'd let something slip into this that I would never let slip into a smaller item like a decorative box or something like that. Yeah, I think we're all guilty of that. If you've got a real small project, you think everybody's really going to be scrutinized it where something big, you can kind of hide the errors. Yeah, and I think it also has a lot to do with just being lazy. I mean, when you start out on a big project for the first couple, or for a couple days, you might be very meticulous, but... Then as time goes on, maybe a couple of weeks, you just want to see the end result. So you might start to slip here and there, not on big things like joinery is going to make your project fall apart, but on smaller things like maybe that drawer could be fit a little better. Those things that you think you can get away with, that's where you let the errors creep in. Yeah, and the article focused on that too. If you, know, you start letting those errors pile up and just ignoring them, it's going to really hurt you in the overall project quality. Right, you have to be tough with yourself and do it right every time. And if you do, then you're going to you know, get rid of those bad habits and increase your skill. So you're going to be less likely to make errors or to let things slide in the future. It'll just become easier for you to work the right way. And so it's the best of both worlds. I agree. Turns out Chuck Bender and Glenn Huey aren't killers after all. You may recall how my keen sense of observation was piqued a few weeks ago when Robert Lang disappeared from the 360 Woodworking Audio podcast. Lang hadn't appeared on an episode since January, and the woodworking threesome turned twosome gave us the flimsy he's under the weather excuse. <laughs> well, I wasn't buying it. I suggested that Chuck and Glenn had brutally murdered Bob in a fit of tool jealousy and was planning on pretending he was alive by carrying his body around with them to the woodworking shows, like the guys on Weekend at Bernie's. Well, our investigative team was on it, and there was no hiding the truth. It turned out that Bob Lang had been under the weather. Chuck Bender contacted me shortly after the show aired in mid-March to plead his innocence, and soon after that, Bob told me the details himself. He was feeling much better, but he's decided to retire from 360 Woodworking. A week ago, both sides made it official with their own announcements. Lang has moved on, and the guys wish him the best. I suspect we'll be hearing more from Bob about his plans in the coming months, and I know we'll be seeing big things from Glenn and Chuck. The only question now is, since there are no longer three of them, should they change the name of their podcast to... 260 woodworking. 
Are you so excellent that you deserve an award? Popular Woodworking is now taking entries for the 2015 Excellence Awards. You're invited to submit your work to be judged in one or more of five categories, including casework, cabinets and bookcases, seating, tables, boxes and small items, turnings and carvings. Winners of each of the five categories will have their work featured in the November issue of the magazine, plus a $100 gift card. One grand prize winner will receive a thousand bucks. Details can be found at the link, of course, in the show notes. You know what I hate? Spring clamps. So when I saw the new bandy clamps Rockler has just came out with, I admit I wasn't all that excited. But I think I judged them too quickly. I hadn't taken into consideration the bandy part of the clamp. So I got a set for the workshop and Mustache Mike has been spending some time with them. Now, before he subjects them to his Nobel Prize winning mustache meter, which judges based on quality, performance, and value, I thought we'd have a little fun with it. So check out this short video. All right, Mr. Mustache, let's get serious. How well do they hold up to your mustache meter Let's talk about the first category, quality. Well, first of all, I was having little problems with plastic. Seems like everything is made out of plastic anymore, and kind of old-fashioned. If it doesn't have metal in it, it's, you know, it's kind of junk. But uh, really, uh, these um, are not junk. They were more than I expected, even though they are entirely made up of plastic. Um, they really made me a believer. It's good, high-density uh, materials. Uh, they're extremely tough. We tested them for strength on all kinds of different stuff. Really worked that uh, banding piece in there, stretching it. And uh, in this case, plastic's a good idea. They're lighter. I think it's going to keep the production cost down. And I'm going to have to give it four good mustaches for quality. Okay. What about your second category, which is performance? Did they work as advertised? Yes. In fact, performance-wise, um, that's what sets them apart from other types of spring clamps. Again, that band provides a third clamping direction, so you can do things that you can't do with other spring clamps. Makes them real stable, too, when they're on the material. We tested, you know, putting some edge banding on, which I think that's really where these are going to shine. And, I mean, you can really hold that down well 
Um, you know, especially when you got to worry about setup time with your glue. You know, you're you're hurrying at times. So I know, you know, there's a lot of other spring clamps out there that are a whole lot less. So maybe you want to just buy um, a pair or two, you know, for good projects and use some of the cheaper ones to kind of supplement it. But yeah, I'll tell you what, five full stashes as far as uh, performance, great clamp. And finally, overall value, are they worth the price? You know, they're about $8 each if you buy them in quantity, about 10 if you buy them you know, in pairs. And again, there are gonna be spring clamps out there that are probably 99 cents, but you, you get what you pay for if you want a quality tool. And I know Rockler's always concerned about uh, quality. Um, it's going to cost you a little bit more. But again, if that's an issue, you know, just get a couple for a special task. Use some of your cheap ones and others or outfit yourself with what you need. It's a good justifiable shop um, expense in my opinion. So I'll give it four mustaches for value. So there you have it folks. The new Rockler Bandy Clamps get four and a third out of five mustaches. A very high rating. Stay tuned to StumpyNubs.com for more of the best in woodworking tools, tips, and infotainment. We've been away for the last couple of weeks, so we didn't ask you to enter to win any tools. Well, fear not. We went ahead and we drew a name from the subscribers of our newsletter over at StumpyNubs.com. R.W. Crosby is the winner of a Woodworker's Journal Annual 2014 CD with all the issues for the year. So congratulations, RW. We have some great tools to give away, which we'll tell you about in our next episode. But we'll also occasionally be sending out random prizes like this to people just for being on our newsletter list. So sign up at snuffynubs.com. And with that, we wrap things up for this week. But we're back on schedule, so you can expect a new episode next weekend and every week after that as well as the new project videos we just told you about. In the meantime, though, please visit StumpyNubs.com and check out our project plans, because that's how we support all of this wonderful woodworking goodness that you see. We can't thank you enough for that support. You should sit back and have yourself a cold one, because you definitely earned it, my friend.